so we talk about standard deviation, <coughs> um, and this, can, this, this is often reported, and it can give you a clue as to the range of responses and the size of the sample. So standard deviation, we're back to this sample based on normal populations. And the standard deviation reflects how closely individual scores cluster around the mean. And things get tighter to the mean, the larger the sample. So um, you'll be familiar, I suspect, with the Gaussian curve. This is what standard deviation is talking about. <coughs> um, it's two parameters, which are the mean, which is the thick black line up the middle, and the standard deviation from the mean, which is the coloured bars. Um, it's usually symmetrical. You can see them skewed to one side or the other, which would give you concerns about the normal distribution of the population. But generally, you'll see them as a bell-shaped curve. And lots of biological characteristics conform to this. So things like height, blood pressure, um, some random errors in lab measurements, and, and biomechanical data can apply to that as well. But one standard deviation away from the mean in either direction, so on this slide that's the red areas, would account for about 68% of the population. Um, if you go two standard deviations away, so that would be the red areas and the green areas, you've got about 95% of people captured in that particular area under the curve. Um, and if you take all of the coloured areas, the, green, the blue, the green and the red, that accounts for about 99% of the population. And this, this is pretty standard for virtually any, any group of measurements. So if you look at um, assignment um, marks, there'll be some people who do really badly, there'll be some people who do spectacularly well, but most people will be somewhere around the middle. Um, now, the question then is, why is this useful? Um, and what it can do is it can tell you about the type of data and the range of data. So, again, if you don't watch The Simpsons, you won't be familiar with Springfield Elementary, where Bart and Lisa Simpson go. But if we say that Springfield Elementary has got a higher mean test score than Shelbyville, um, we might go, well, that's obvious, it's because the kids at Springfield Elementary are brighter. But if we looked at the standard deviation and we found that one school had a larger standard deviation than the other, it might tell you that there are more kids at one school that are scoring at the extreme ends. Does that make sense? So that would actually change your, your deviation. So you could ask a few follow-up questions. You might find out that Springfield's mean was skewed because all gifted kids are sent to Springfield Elementary. Or Shelbyville Elementary has just taken children who have special educational needs that have been mainstreamed into education. Um, the thing is, if you looked at the standard deviation, it helps point you in the right direction to wonder why the information is like it is. It can tell you about the worth of all the studies that are sent to the press. Um, when they, you know, people talk about relationships, you know, if, you've, if somebody said there was a relationship between eating Kit Kats and assassinating politicians, you might think, you know what, I don't see that being normally distributed at all. <laughs> and so you would question the validity of the study. So basically, the larger the, the larger the standard deviation reported, the, the further from the mean, the more the more extreme results they have reported. And when we come on to looking at some of the stuff we did with the questionnaire I did with my colleagues, you'll see what I'm talking about, particularly when I'm talking about shoes. Standard deviation crosses them all, but. So you'd use it more in parametric tests than you would in non-parametric tests. Because once again, in non-parametric tests, the, the numbers are not particularly meaningful. Sometimes it's used in attitudinal questionnaires. Um, they also tend to be the, the, the studies that report mean and make people like me chew the carpet. But <laughs> So yeah, this is this again. Sorry, nursery example. But if you look at if you, if this is blood pressure, um, your blood pressure is usually 
one, uh, it's usually two numbers, one top number, 120, the bottom number's between uh, 80 and 80, 85. But you can see here that if you looked at the standard deviation, um, the mean is around 80. Um, and if you go one standard deviation, you're talking about, what, 73 to 93? And that would capture 68% of the population in that. Um, a small tail at one end have got a very low um, bottom figure of 50. A small tail at the other end have got a very high figure, which they're probably on medication for. But you can see it's pretty normally distributed. Um, and you would get, you would, you would expect to see that. Okay, with standard deviation and p-values, I mentioned confidence interval, and confidence interval really focuses on uncertainty. Um, it's normally reported within a 95% confidence interval, and. That means if you have an overall range of values, and again, um, we're talking ordinal and ratio data here, we've got a range of values within which we can be 95% sure that the true value for the whole population is encapsulated in that range. So, if I was undertaking a drugs trial, and I came up with a number needed to treat of 10, which would mean I would expect to treat 10 people with my drug to get one positive outcome. With a 95% confidence interval of 5 and 15, I'd have a 95% confidence that the true number needed to treat value was between those two figures. And that's because when you're dealing with, with particularly things like blood pressure or blood samples, blood gases, anything that can change from minute to minute, if I took everybody's blood pressure now, it would be a snapshot in time. And if I took your blood pressures after lunch, that would be different. So what I would end up with is a range of blood pressures from my entire group, and I would be 95% confident that within that range, the true figure for the whole group lies. Now, while that, why that's important is if you're reading a paper and the confidence interval, I, interval is massive, so if somebody says we've got a 95% confidence interval and the range is 5 to 650, you go, oh dear, because this isn't telling me anything. The confidence interval is so huge, I don't know what the true figure might be. And it's so massive, it's got so much, so much play in it, that it's not really telling me anything important. Um, but it's based on the evidence, which is why, going back to what we were talking about with the p-values, a lot of journals now are going no to the p-values, yes to the confidence interval because that's actually based on the data from the study and not just on the arbitrary statistical relationship that um, you find when you analyse the data. So there's three key messages here. Um, you have to know, can you see now why I laboured the point about parametric and non-parametric and categorical and ratio? You have to know what type of data you've got. Um, you have to be really clear about what questions you want the data to answer before you start. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit this a bit this afternoon when we, we talk about questionnaires, but it's talking to somebody in the break. Um, and this is often this is often the problem. So you do your questionnaire, you get massive amounts of data, which is great and really exciting, and then you look at it and go, I don't know what to do with this. What, what, what am I doing with this? Um, so you need to know what questions you want the data to answer. Um, and sometimes just doing a simple descriptive runoff of the data will, will make you, will give you clues. But it helps to know what data you want to answer. And, and you need to collect the right data and to make sure that it's clean. And by clean, I mean that it's not inaccurate and that you've made a decision in your own mind what you're going to do with missing data. So particularly, again, with questionnaires, but it's not just questionnaires. Um, if you're collecting a series of measurements from somebody over a, a six months um, and they don't show up on month four, what are you going to do? You can't, if you take them out of your study, 
that's going to skew your overall results. If you leave them in, that might skew your overall results. Some people would argue that you just take the mean of what you've got already and use that as data, but that's a bit dodgy because you're making stuff up. Um, the convention with things like questionnaires or, or even things like biome biomedical measurement is use a number that is clearly not part of the data. So with questionnaires, if you're, if you're coding, say, one to five, use minus nine for missing data. And then what you can do is you can, you can identify where you've got missing data or you can ask SPSS just to disregard missing data and see what difference that makes. What you don't want to do is leave something blank because that will affect how, you, how your results turn out.